God's got on your heart for us. Amen. God's good, isn't he? How many of you know Jesus is here today? I brought him here when I came. Amen. Today I want to look for breakthrough. I believe in a God of breakthrough. You believe in a God of breakthrough? Amen. Sometimes it's good to get back to original Bible, the old paper Bible. This thing is acting crazy right now. But God is good, and we want to pray today. We want to believe God. How many of you need God to touch you in a way that you really need a breakthrough? You need a miracle. You need God to do something supernaturally in your life. You've been waiting. You've been waiting on him, right? But the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. You know, delay is not denial. Delay is not denial. Denial is an e a river in Egypt, someone told me. And I know my own family that there are those that are waiting for a miracle. So a miracle is a supernatural act of God. A miracle is beyond me. I call miracles God's zone. That's a place where the doctors can't go. That's a place where the, the accountant can't go. Come on, right? It's a place where no mommy can't go, daddy can't go. For your miracle, only you can go to the place where the miracles happen and God creates an atmosphere. And sometimes in that atmosphere, I say many times in that atmosphere, that's where the, the manifest presence of God comes the manifest presence of God is so different than the omnipresence or everywhere presence of God. It's when God just shows up, and it, just put it this way, it's like talking to me on the phone, not texting, amen? And then having, I don't know who she is, who's this beautiful woman here in the church today, amen? First lady of the church, amen? And then having me here, that's the difference between omnipresent and present, being manifest presence. I never sat on the pastor's lap before. I won't. And, and, and what we need today is we enjoy the presence of God, but we need God's manifest presence in this house. Amen? Amen. And we begin to experience that today um, as we were in worship, just making a joyful noise. And we'll never sing like the angels. We're out of tune when it comes to that. But I believe that sometimes you wait. And you wait. And you wait. And sometimes you give up on waiting, and you get tired, tired of this. Why am I even trying any longer? Come on, not someone sitting in here today like that. I have it in my own family, I know. I've had it in my own life. Well, I needed God to touch me in such a way. And then one day, I must say one day. Come on, maybe it's today. Maybe it is today. Tell somebody, say, maybe today. Maybe right now. This moment. Maybe it won't be you touching me. Maybe it be God touching me. Maybe I'll walk out of here with the cancer gone or the tumor gone or the back problem gone or the pain gone or the neck problem gone or the depression gone or the manic depression gone or the sickness gone or the brokenness gone. It may happen right now in the core, his glory, Christian assembly. Matter of fact, I'm believing God that it's going to happen today. Come on, give him a shout of praise. Mark chapter 2, very familiar part, narrative. Amen. I probably preached better then than I would in this whole message. Amen. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And again he entered Capernaum after some day, and they heard that he was in the house. 
Immediately many gathered together, so there was no room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their heart, Why does this man speak blasphemy like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on the earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out of their presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never seen anything like this. Come on, church. We never seen anything like this. Once more time once again we need God to move the Bible says he came there again how many of you know if he was there once he'll come back again God is a God of the second chance. God will always walk around you, get around your life, give you opportunity, make ways for you where there seems to be no way because God is the God of once more. Tell somebody, say, my God is the God of once more. That song we used to sing, Joe, is he'll do it again. He'll do it again. I serve an again God. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. You have a God that is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. Why do you think he went to the cross? He went to the cross for us. I ain't never seen anything like this. But the Bible says something interesting there. Several things that we'll point out this morning. He said he came again. Lift your hands up and say, God, do it again. How many of you know we need him again and again and again and again and again? Hallelujah. And again. But when he came, how many of you know when God shows up, he makes noise? Here's what it says. When he came again, they heard. Whenever God moves, he makes a sound. You see, you can take it all the way back to the Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth. You see, God had to make a sound before he created anything. And here's what God said. It says the Spirit of God moved, sat upon it like it was hatching it. Amen. And then God made a sound. He said, let there be. Everybody say, God, let it be. He said, let there be. And when God made the sound, let it be from his mouth, from his heart, from his desires, from his passion, from the intent of his heart. When God said, let it be, what happened? It was. Come on, church. Because God made a sound. God made a sound when he walked with Adam in the cool of the day. Adam said to God, he said, I heard you walking in the midst of us, God. Can you hear him walking in the midst of you right now? See, in the formation of man, when God formed him in the dust of the ground, he made a sound. He spoke to him and said, be blessed, be fruitful. 
No, he didn't speak death. He didn't speak sickness. He didn't speak brokenness. He didn't speak depression. He didn't make you come to make you unhappy. Hallelujah. He came to make you blessed means happy. Amen. He said, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion over the earth. Hallelujah. When God shows up, he makes noise. Amen. When, I, when, when Abraham brought Isaac up on the mountain, he was about ready to give a sacrifice to God. God made a sound. He heard the rustling in the, in the bush. He said, there's a, there's a ram in the thicket. How many of you know God made a sound before he made provision? Come on, church. I'm going to help you today. Give you some revelation. That's the only thing that sets you free is revelation. Amen. God made a sound for David when he laid under the mulberry trees. He said, when you hear the sound in the mulberry trees, you'll know I'm moving. Come on, when God makes noise around your life, you'll know he's moving. Sometimes he has to make a sound to let you know he's around your life before you get your miracle. Hallelujah. Sometimes you got to hear things that you haven't heard before. Maybe God's going to speak some things that he hasn't spoken to you before. Maybe he's going to shake some things that he hasn't shaken before. But when he gets around your life, you're going to hear about it. You're going to know about it because he's going to make some noise. When Elijah was on the top of the mountain, the earth shook, the fire came, the wind blew. But God wasn't in all that stuff. He was listening to sounds, but he didn't hear the right sound. Sometimes we can hear sounds, but it's not the right sounds, sis. We can listen to this, and we can listen to that. You know, we can even go back past it and listen to the old experiences that we used to have. We can get back into the old revelations of what God did. We spent a lot of time on Azusa Street, 1906, amen, when God made some noise back then. We're always remembering, commemorating. But how many of you know God does new things? And for his glory, Christian assembly, God will do new things. Come on, church. And sometimes we're looking to the old ways or the old things or the old methods. And that's what the religious crowd does. They look to the old ways and the old things. But God's stepping up in the midst. He said, I'm going to make some new noise up in here. Come on, church. And then the life of David and Elijah and the life of Jesus when he got baptized in the River Jordan, when he came out of the River Jordan, the, the Spirit fell upon Jesus like a dove. And he heard God say something. Come on. What did he say? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Because he's got some stuff he's going to tell you. Hallelujah. Not as he's going to tell you, but he's going to show you some things. Remember in Acts chapter 4, when the church raised up the lame man? Remember he got lame? The man, he was jumping and leaping and praising God. And they, they brought him in there and said, shut up. Stop talking about Jesus. And they said, why is it that everybody wants us to stop talking about Jesus? We should be talking about Jesus. We should always be talking about Jesus. Everybody wants you to stop talking about Jesus. Don't stop talking about Jesus. Keep on talking about Jesus. The only answer we have is if we talk about Jesus. Jesus. And so they came back. And they stepped in that prayer meeting that we're having here on Monday nights. If you haven't been to one, you go enjoy it. Amen. And the prayer meeting is where it shook. God made a sound. And great grace was given to them. And great power was given to them. Why? Because when God shows up, he makes noise. Amen. Has he ever made any noise around your life? Have you heard him? Can you hear him moving? He's moving today. He's, making, he's moving today. Sometimes we can't hear him because we get so caught up in our own thing. And they heard there wasn't any room to receive him because what happens when God begins to move in a house, when God begins to move in a church, when God begins to move in a community, everyone around it is going to begin to be impacted by the presence of God, by the manifestation of God. What it says that they could not get in the door of Peter's house. Peter's mother-in-law is laying there sick and Jesus said, when I'm in the house, you can't lay around up in here being sick. And he walked to the bed of Peter's mother-in-law, took her by the hand and raised her up. He said, go make something to eat because once God raises you up, he puts you back into service again. How can you be sitting in the presence of God? 
Got a fever. There's too many people feverish. Hot-headed. Oh, man. Amen? But when he came in and when his presence is there, he's going to raise you up. Something just dropped into my spirit. He's also going to lock out those things that to try to come back into your life to keep you breaking, to keep you down. Also, when he's in the house, it's you and him in that encounter. It's you and him as he's coming around. You can hear him moving in that place. It's you and him when he's speaking the word. And his word is not a word of man. His word is a word of the kingdom. It's the word of the Father. It's a decree from the throne of God. It's that decree when God says something and he decrees it. When he puts it into place. When he, God says it, it's done. It's a done deal. No one's changing it. When God told them you're going into the promised land, they traveled around for 40 years. But God declared that you're going in there. When God says you're free, when he told that the centurion that his servant was, was healed, the very moment that Jesus spoke that word, the, servant, the centurion went back. And he said, when, he was, when was he healed? He said, it was the same moment you were talking to Jesus because when Jesus said something, it gets done right at that moment. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He told the Syrophoenician woman who came and said, even the, even the dogs will eat from the crumbs that fall off the table. He said, I've never seen any faith in a woman like that. How, how some of you women get some faith up in here today. Hallelujah. I've never seen any faith like that. Someone said, how'd your daughter get set free? How'd your son get saved? How'd your mother get saved? How'd your children get saved? Because you dropped down and said, I take a crumb from the kingdom of God, from the king of kings and the Lord of glory. I'll take a crumb. The very moment. She went to her house. The daughter was sitting up in her right mind. Hallelujah. Because we ain't here preaching no ordinary word. We're preaching the words of the king. We're preaching the stories of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When I talk about him showing up in the house, this isn't some comic book skit. This is a true story. He came into the house. He made some noise in the house. He spoke the kingdom word in the house. Amen. Because when you really boil it all down, it's all about you and not about him. Jesus said to come, the son of man has not come to serve, to be served. He said, I've come to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So when you really put that into context of what we're looking at today, the Son of Man has come to serve you. See, Jesus did everything he did for you, man. Humanity, you, man. <laughs> he came to do it for you. And if he came to do it for you, he'll do it one more time. He'll do it again. Give the Lord a hand clap praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. He entered again. So he did a few things when he came into the house. He came to say something. Sometimes we want God in our life, but we don't want to hear what he has to say. I want all the blessings. I want all this from God, but I'm not willing to hear what he's going to say. But how many of you know sometimes God has to say some things to us? Are you ready to hear what he truly has to say? Because not, sometimes not all of those things are going to be, to be a comfort to you. Sometimes they're going to speak to you for correction. Sometimes he's going to speak some things because what he's going to do, he said, my sheep hear my voice and they do what? They follow me. How do you know it's easy for us to get off track? It's easy for us to lose focus. 
And we can start wandering away from the shepherd. And so so he, he's going to speak some things in, for, into our lives. So it's not as he comes to take that word from God's kingdom, but he's, he's doing it to speak it into our lives to help us, to move us, to direct us, to change us. Aren't you glad that you serve a God who wants to speak into your life? That he wants to speak into your life? Because sometimes we can get so knocked down, we can believe everybody else's word. We can believe the negative word. We can believe the, the, the bad report. But I like what Isaiah says, whose report are you going to believe? He said, I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. And sometimes God has to speak that word. He moves around us. We hear him moving. And then he begins to speak to us. He says, it's going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. You're going to get through. You're going to make it. You don't think that you can make it, but you're going to make it. Because I'm here. I'm with you. I'm present with you. I'm for you. I'm on your side. I'm going to help you through it. You may May not like the spanking you're going to get, but it's going to help you. Whom the Lord loves, he corrects. You may not like what he has to say about a certain situation, because we want our cake and eat it too. But he's going to say some things to us that need to be said. Hallelujah. He's going to say some things. He's here to change some things. And nothing changes unless we hear what he has to say. So how many believe that God's word is a word of promise? And God's word is a word of truth. And God's presence and his miracle power is presence, is present. He's here moving. I hear him moving. He's here speaking. I can hear him speaking. He's speaking to me right now. But I need a miracle in my life. And this is what I want to talk to you. Just a few moments. I need a miracle in my life. But the door is locked. The door is locked. The door is the porthole. The door is the access in. It seems like everything, and we're talking about people who need a physical manifestation of healing in their body, or they need a breakthrough in their life. And you say to yourself, you know, I keep on coming, but I feel like the door is locked. You ever been there? The door is locked. I, I know, I, I need to get to Jesus, but the door is locked. You see, there's all kinds of things that are trying to keep us away from God. There's that spirit of religion that will stand in the, uh, in the front of the door. That spirit of condemnation. That spirit of legalism. That religious spirit that would continue to try to get us back into this religious way of thinking. How many of you know you can't get a breakthrough when your mind's in this religious mindset? We sit around, we condemn ourselves. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. So what I do is I get with the religious crowd, Right? How many of you ever contended with a spirit of religion? Amen. And so because of this, this religious way of doing things, there's a method, there's a one, two, three step of how to do this. There's a one uh, point A, um, one A, B, C, D. And i got to make all sure all these things are correct. If I don't have this correct, then that's not going to work. If I don't have that corrected, that's not going to work. So I go to my religious drawing board, and I say, well, I've done this, check. I've done this, check. I've done this, check. But nothing's working. Everything I do is checking off, but I'm doing it through that religious mind mindset. Amen. How many of you have done that? And so instead of getting my breakthrough, I get caught up in doing these method things. Maybe if I do this one more thing. Maybe if I do that one more thing. But none of those methods are working. And I think that's why the religious people got upset with Jesus. How can this man forgive this man's sin? And I, he got, they got so caught up. Instead of looking at what happened to the guy. Amen. Look at the miracle. Look at what God's doing. We can get caught up in that religious mindset. So I think what we got to do today is we got to shake out that religious spirit. Everybody shake your head. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is beyond religion. It's beyond this one, two, three method. You know, take a little um, apple cider and put it in with a little lemon. Stir it around, right? Apple cider vinegar, and it's good for you with all this thing. And you can go on and read all this stuff. I want to take this. It's going to help me shed weight. The best way to shed weight is to move your hips and not your lips. Amen. 
Joe's looking good, isn't he? So it's that religious spirit. It's that reasoning. It's that human reasoning. I'm listening to the doubt. I'm listening to the fear. I'm listening to the unbelief. I'm rationalizing everything. Why I didn't get it. Why I didn't get the breakthrough. Well, that reasoning keeps the locked door locked. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. Someone came to me one time. She said, they, they kept on saying, I'm thinking I'm getting, I'm thinking I'm getting my miracle. I said, thinking ain't going to get your miracle. You don't think it away. You don't try to reason these things away. It's the manifest presence of God. It's when you hear him. It's when he speaks into your life. It takes you beyond logic. This is not logical. You see a miracle where somebody gets out of a bed in a hospital where the doctor says you'll never rise up again. And you sit there and you reason this whole thing out. And God said, why don't you stop thinking and start trusting. Amen? Or maybe it's that rebellion that keeps it out, that spirit of rebellion. Amen? You know, we can become rebellious in our heart. If I harbor sin in my heart, what? God will not hear me. And that will lock the door. So I think the first thing to do to get rid of rebellion, I'm going to give you the key, is to repent. See, repent takes you from the doghouse to the penthouse. Because the first word is re, that means to come back to where you were, and pent means the high place. So when I repent, I come from the low place to the high place. And if you want to turn things around, it's just come to that place of repentance with God. Hallelujah. So it's that religious spirit, it's that spirit of rationalization and reasoning, it's that, that spirit of re re uh, rebellion in our heart. We hold resentment in our heart. We hold bitterness in our heart. And the door is locked. And the door is locked. Ruined lives laid up. Laid up too long. Tell somebody, said, you've been laid up too long. You know, that man sat at that gate for 38 years. He said, every time the waters tremble, somebody else gets in there first. I thought to myself, I'd be waterlogged because I'd be sitting in that thing. You know, and then we start looking at that. We start looking out, everybody else getting theirs, and I'm not getting mine. Amen? I'm not getting mine, but they're getting theirs. So how do we unlock the door? How do we get in? First of all, find yourself four people that will believe with you. Get one person that will stand with you in faith and believe with you. This man is a paralytic. He's laying on the bed. It doesn't say how long he was laying on the bed, but it says he was laying on the bed. He was broken. He was hurting. He was suffering. He was going through rejection. He hadn't moved, didn't have a job. His, he was an outcast. People around him said, there's that old lame guy. Hey, there, you, when you're lame, everybody knows it. Can't do anything for himself. He wants everybody to enable him. Every time he turns around, he's looking for something. But four people went. Probably Peter, James, John, Andrew, who knows. But there were four of them that caught a hold of this guy. You see, you can't get lifted unless you allow somebody to lift you. Some pastor's going to India, and he's going there. We're going to pray over him that God uses him to lift up people that are broken and paralyzed and carry them into the presence of Jesus. Amen. That's like that woman that had the, the, the credit that was at the door. And Elijah said, go borrow some vessels. He said, I don't want to go borrow for anybody from anybody. I have to ask somebody to help me get involved in my life. I don't want people up involved in my life. I'd rather deal with this myself. How many of you can get like that? I'm self-sufficient. I'm self-governing. I can handle this myself. I can handle this pain. I can handle this pain. 
Get around somebody. Get around with a Holy Ghost man, a Holy Ghost woman, filled with the Holy Spirit and praying in tongue, casting out devil, lays hands on the sick, and let them get up around you and encompass them around you. See, four means it encompasses. You ain't going to the left. You're not going to the right. You're not going backwards. You're not going sideways. Every time you try to get back to the old way of thinking, when you got people around you that are filled with God and are filled with the Spirit, they're not letting you go to the left, to the right, to the backwards, forwards. They're going to keep on preaching that word. They got your front covered, your back covered, your side covered. They're going to get around you and keep on preaching faith and keep on preaching that word and keep on lifting you up. Sometimes they have to drag your dead carcass. Some of you, how did you get to church today? I got drug. Didn't drive? No. Somebody drug my dead carcass to this altar. I see a lot of people that have got drug. Dragged, whatever you want to call it. God has anointed men who bring breakthrough. Restoration ministries. We've seen more healing and deliverance and breakthrough in people's lives. Fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, cancers on breast, marriages that are broken. Drug addicts that were delivered after 30 years of, ha of a heroin addiction. Whew. You know, God anoints men to bring breakthrough. And if you get up around somebody that has that kind of breakthrough anointing on your life, then they're going to get you into the presence of Jesus. My wife said this to, on the way up. She said, we never saved anybody. I said, amen. You never healed anybody. I said, amen. I don't even know how they could sit there listening for 45 minutes. Amen. But you know what? It's God that because our mission is to grab a hold of you and get you through and get that breakthrough and tear into whatever needs to be tear into and believe that we're going to get down into the manifest presence of God, that someone's going to get one more time, one more touch, one more healing, one more deliverance, one more strengthening, one more word of encouragement from the Lord. They're going to get in the presence of Jesus. Four things and we'll come to the altar. Number one. There are four things you want, you need in your life to get your breakthrough. Faith. Faith can't be in faith. You don't focus your faith on faith. Your faith has got to be focused on Jesus. Focused on Jesus. When they're bringing this man, when they're bringing this sick person, this broken person, this, this bitter person, this angry person, this sinful person, this hateful person, this drug addict, whoever they are, when they're coming to Jesus, when we're bringing them to Jesus, we're not talking about our church. We ain't talking about the colored chairs we have. We ain't talking about how great our worship team is. And how good everybody gives in our church because we're not bringing them to church. You bring them to church, and half the times you bring them to hell. But when you bring them to Jesus, because they can get in church and find a nice warm seat and plug their self in there and never encounter Jesus and never get saved. People sit in the church today that are not saved. The good tithers, the good givers, the good workers, but they don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ because somebody brought them to church. Come on, I'm, I don't know how it got up on this, but somebody got them to church instead of getting them to Jesus. When I got saved, I didn't, get, I didn't come to church. Someone brought me to meet Jesus. And that evangelist that was preaching in a, in a Christian Missionary Alliance church, that's why I got saved. That 17-inch figure came around and poked me, poked me in the side. I tried to hide, but I couldn't hide. And I encountered Jesus. Not church, not churchianity, and not quote-unquote Christianity. Today's modern form of Christianity, liberal Christianity. Ooh, my God, I didn't know it's going here. Help me, Jesus. Honey, pull my tail when I stop the truck. My faith is in Christ. It was Jesus Christ that hung on the cross, not Mary, not St. Jude, not St. Paul, St. Peter, even though he was crucified upside down, but it was Jesus. It was Jesus that said, one more time, God. Let me come in this house one more time. It was Jesus. 
If our focus is on everything else but Jesus, today it's, it's on compromise. It's on watering it down. It's not on the message of the cross. It's not on Jesus. Everything else is on everything else but Jesus. We'll preach everything else but Jesus. We got more self-help books on the market today. There's one book, four pills that'll help you, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, amen. And so I focus on Jesus. And my wife and things she goes through, we focus on Jesus. And everything tries to distract us. Everything tries to block the door from getting us to, from us getting to Jesus and having that encounter with Jesus. But we keep on focusing on Jesus, looking under Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And sometimes we get down, and sometimes we get worn out, and sometimes we want to quit. But like Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, when he heard God made a sound in the city, and he heard Jesus was in the city, he began to cry out even the loudest. They said, stop crying out to Jesus. He said, I'm not crying out to this religious crowd or that liberal church or that unrighteous group. He said, I'm crying out to the King of kings and the Lord of glory. I see the King of glory, for my eyes have seen the King. And Jesus said, wait a minute, you call out to me, I'm coming to you. They said to the church, see, it was the church that was standing in the way. They were surrounding Jesus, keeping people out. And Bartimaeus said, what's happening? He said, Jesus said, who's passing by? He said, I feel something in the spirit. Come on, church. I feel something in the spirit that's moving me. I don't usually act this way. I like it when these people get crazy and they start acting crazy. I don't usually act this way. But what's happening to you? Jesus is moving. Faith is arising. And he can't see a thing, but faith is the substance of things. Hopefully the evidence of not, things not yet seen. I can't see a thing. But I hear something that's, uh, it's called entheos, um, God in me. I feel enthusiasm rising up in me, and I start to shout out to God. I shout out in faith, not unbelief, not doubt, not reasoning, not in no religion. I'm shouting out to get a hold of Jesus. Are you here? Let me hear you shout amen. amen. It, takes, it takes faith. And let me say something to you for all your faith watchers out there, your faith movement people out there. It doesn't take great faith. Jesus said if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you're going to speak to the mountain and say it be moved. There are so many people that got injured because they didn't have enough faith. They needed to have great faith. I don't have great faith. Well, Jesus nullified that whole message when he said all you have to do is have a grain of mustard seed of faith. And then even Paul added to it. He said, God's given you a measure of faith. I think God may have given you the mustard seed faith to move mountains. Amen. We get hyped on this faith thing. Well, all I have to do is have that little faith. You know, sometimes I don't, sometimes that all, sometimes all I have is just a little faith. All I have is like a little tiny mustard seed of faith. And I hear all these people coming up into me, you ought to have great faith. And I want to slap them. But all their Christian eases, God's fire. You don't want to hear that. You can't hear all that. You're laying on a cot. You're paralyzed. You can't even move. You feel like you have faith. You feel like God has forsaken you. But somehow, that little seed, that when you got born again, when you got born of the Spirit, that little measure that God put in on the inside of you, that hell tried to come against, that the devil tries to steal, he can't get that because it's in you. You grab a hold of it. And you start believing, and that little seed becomes a mustard seed, a great tree, and it begins to grow, and all it started out with just that little tiny bit of faith. I don't feel like I have faith, and some of you are here today. But I'm here to tell you, you have it, because he's given it to you. He would not leave you. Now, I crashed the boards on that one. Amen. I'm sick and tired of it. You know how many people I, I, I have walked away from God? God said, look, 
You, you see how easy that was moved? I've already placed. How many have Jesus on the inside of you? How many have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you? How many have faith on the inside of you? And how many of you know sometimes it goes all the way down to that which you can barely see? And when it gets to that point, that's when you're on the miracle ground. That's when you plant it into the soil of Christ. And then it begins to move. I don't know what was happening to this man as he was being drug up a roof. But to be drug up a roof means that you came down from a lower position to a higher position. I don't know. Maybe when that believer started to pull him up, his faith got more and more and more and more. Maybe the more they spoke to him, come on, we're getting closer to Jesus. We're almost there. We're almost there. Your miracle is almost there. We're just a few tiles away from getting your breakthrough. Maybe the closer they got. Well, faith is very important. You need one more thing. You need openness. If you're going to believe God, you've got to be open to matter, no matter what he wants to do in my life. If God says to that Nahum, go wash in the River Jordan. He said, man, why are you there? Why can't I do it this way? Because God told you to do it that way. Be open to what God says. Be open to what God said. What, I'm taking my faith and whatever God tells me. Come on, we're going through the roof. Come on, man, can't we go through the door? Openness to God, we close down. The enemy wants you to shut down. He wants you to shut down. He doesn't want you to be open to the move of God. And when he steals your faith, he fills it with fear. And when you have fear, the bolt slides across the door because the heart is no longer open. The heart is closed. But I'm here to open it up for you today in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you're open to God, say one more time, God. Once again, God. I'm open to no matter what you want to do in my life. I'm going to stand open. Man, this is the hardest thing for me to do is to lift my hands and surrender to God. That means I'm open. This means I'm closed. When I'm closed, he can't come in, but when I'm open, oh, God, I'm open for one more touch. God, I'm open for what you want to do. I'm standing with my little feet, with my little mustard seed of faith, but God, I'm open to whatever you want to do in my life, oh, God. I'm going to get in unity with you. I'm going to get in unity with your spirit, oh, God. I'm going to get in unity with your spirit, God. So it's faith, it's openness, it's unity in the spirit. It's one more thing, and I'm coming to the altar. You got to release and receive. See, many of us, we come to the altar and we release. That's our release. We bring it to the altar. Oh God, I release it. I leave it with you. Oh, God, I leave it with you. Oh, God, I'm going to leave it with you. You get the picture? Oh, I'm leaving it with God. I went to the altar to leave it with God. Well, how come it's still in your hand? How come it's still on you? Because you didn't release it. Well, how can you? You've you got to release it. When you give it to God, give it to God. Then believe God. Then stand there to receive it. God, I'm here to receive it. The man came to, he didn't know what was going to happen when he hit the feet of Jesus, but he was open. He was re ready to relieve his brokenness, release it to Jesus. Your faith has made you well. This man said, I didn't realize I had that faith. Was it great faith? No, it was that faith that was spoken because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It was faith that was spoken by those that went and began to declare the message of hope, the message of the kingdom, and told them, I know everything seems to be locked. I know everything seems like you can't get through, but we're going to get you through. We're going to bring you in. We're going to sit you down into the feet of Jesus. And when I'm going to tell you something, you're never going to be the same again. God's going to raise you up. God's going to cause you to walk. God's going to do a miracle in your life. He entered again. 
Let's stand together. He entered again. Say once more, Jesus. It's time to come higher. It's time to get in. Hey, listen, I, I know. I know how it feels to go through a situation. I'll tell you my last story as I close. I got a problem in my respiratory where I couldn't breathe. When I laid down on my left side, it sounded like I called it the death rattle. Because every time I took a breath, it was rattling on my left side. And I went to the doctors, and they took x-rays, and they did MRIs, and they did all that stuff. And then they made me swallow this stuff, which tasted nasty. Then they made me blow in this little tube. Then they took all these x-rays. Then they brought me and my wife in for counseling. Because they were going to tell me their diagnosis. And the doctor said, you got scars on your lungs from when you had pneumonia eight times. He handed me a $150 inhaler that I was going to have to use. That alone raised faith in me. Amen. And he told me, this is the way you're going to have to live for the rest of your life. And my wife and I, I think we drove in separate cars that day. Because I remember walking out of that doctor's office after that consultation. And I was standing in the driveway. And there was something on the inside of me that made me shoot my hands up to Jesus. And I said, Jesus, I, I am not going to live this way for the rest of my life. I don't care what the doctor had to say. I'm trusting you, Jesus. And that very moment, I took a deep breath. <sighs> and never had the death rattle in me again. From that very moment. Now listen. It's not because I'm any better than you because I put my shoes on one foot at a time. Unless I'm in a hurry. And it's not because I'm not a sinner because I have sinned. I've been saved from sin. Because, and that if you cut me, I bleed. And if you slap me, I cry. I don't know what happened on that day. Maybe I just stepped into a place of a miracle anointing of God. Maybe my faith just hit the right thing. I, I, maybe that arrow prayer that we have seen in our life hit the target. But in any way, it was God that once again he came into Tim Traffer's life. And once again, he moved. And everything seemed closed and shut down. Maybe that's you today. I want you to slip your hands up to God if you need God. You've been waiting on God for a miracle. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's a breakthrough of some sort. Once again, once again, Lord, do it for us. Do it for my life, God, right now. Once again. God, I have the faith because you put it in me. God, I have a little mustard seed faith. But I'm going to hold it up to you and speak to mountains today. I'm going to speak to sickness today. I'm going to speak to poverty today. I'm going to speak to addictions today. I'm going to speak to brokenness and rejection today. I'm going to speak to bitterness today. I'm going to speak to that struggling marriage today. I'm going to speak to that broken child today. I'm going to speak about that rebellious child today. God, I don't have much. Nothing in my hand I bring. Only to the cross I cling today. So I come this morning. I come for a breakthrough. I come for my miracle today. Jesus, you said I stand at the door and knock. God, I come that the door would be open. That you would enter in today. Once again. Once again. Once again, if that's you and you're going to say to God, once again, let me come to the altar and I can anoint you and pray for you. We're going to pray for Pastor Bob before he leaves today. Is that you? You say, I just need God to just touch me supernaturally today. I want you to step out of your seat. <laughs>